Hello, I'm Toby Meyer, State Director of Decoding Dyslexia California. DDCA, in conjunction with our other webinar sponsors, Bright Solutions for Dyslexia and Learning Ally, is pleased to present today's webinar on Dyslexia and Phonological Processing 101 with internationally recognized dyslexia expert, Dr. Richard Wagner. This webinar is intended for parents, advocates, and teachers. While this webinar on dyslexia and phonological processing has universal relevance, Californians are especially interested in this topic due to a new California Education Code effective January 1, 2016, specifically adding phonological processing as an area to be assessed in determining special education eligibility. In addition, the California Dyslexia Guidelines, which were recently released by California Department of Education. If you would like to be notified of upcoming webinars on dyslexia, please connect with Decoding Dyslexia California and our sponsors via our websites or Facebook pages. Before handing the presentation over, I wanted to spend a few minutes introducing Dr. Wagner. Dr. Wagner's accomplishments are so extensive that I have listed some of the additional highlights on the slide. Dr. Wagner leads the Florida Multidisciplinary Learning Disabilities Research Center. This center is, on, is one of only four centers in the United States funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. It represents NIH's flagship program for research on dyslexia and other learning disabilities. He is co-founder and associate director of the Florida Center for Reading Research, and he is a research professor of psychology and MORCOM chair at Florida State University. Dr. Wagner has provided his expertise in helping the states of Arkansas and California develop guidelines to implement statewide dyslexia legislation. Dr. Wagner has co-authored several tests that are commonly used in evaluating children for dyslexia and other learning disabilities, including the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, or CTOP2, which will be discussed in today's webinar. We will do our best to keep the webinar to one hour, but please don't miss the extremely valuable frequently asked questions that Dr. Wagner will cover at the end of this presentation. Now I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Wagner. Welcome, Dr. Wagner. Thank you for the introduction, Toby. I'm delighted to be here and to have a chance to do this. I'll just start with an outline of what our plan is for today. Um, I'm, I'm gonna begin with the topic of why bother to learn anything about phonological processing or how the comprehensive test of phonological processing is used in dyslexia evaluations. You're a parent or an advocate, um, so you're not an expert. Why bother to uh, learn some of this stuff? Um, I'll then talk a little bit about um, what do we know about dyslexia, about what dyslexia is and what it isn't. I'll talk a little bit about what is phonological processing. I'll talk a little bit about how the CTOP2 is used to assess phonological processing and I'll end with the frequently asked questions that um, Toby was just talking about. So beginning with why bother to learn anything about phonological processing or how the CTOP2 is used in dyslexia evaluations. You're a parent, uh, acquaintance of someone who might have dyslexia, not someone trained in dyslexia evaluations. Why should you bother to learn anything about phonological processing? and how the CTOP2 is used in dyslexia evaluations? The answer is that um, knowledge is power. Uh, you really need to be an active member of the team that will be meeting to try to come up with solutions to the problems that your or, um, the person you care about may be having. It, having. Uh, they'll be experts in dyslexia evaluations and they'll know things that you don't know, but no one knows knows a child better than a parent or an advocate if they know them well. And being an active member of a team can be important. Um, although it hasn't been studied for dyslexia, uh, knowledgeable patients who participate in their healthcare decisions have better medical outcomes. Uh, knowing some basics about dyslexia evaluation will enable you to be an active participant in the process. Most professionals do a good job with evaluation, but it doesn't happen 100% of the time. Some basic knowledge along with your gut feeling can help you determine whether you're confident in the evaluation that has been done. Something you might also consider doing is that when you have an initial conference before an evaluation, 
Uh, you might ask that the area of phonological processing be assessed if you have concerns about your child's reading and spelling ability. Um, hopefully it will be, but it doesn't hurt just to mention that you think that's important. You might ask what measures will be used, and you might mention that you participated in a webinar on dyslexia assessment um, using the CTOP2. They may not be using the CTOP2, which is fine. There are other measures out there. They might be using the Woodcock-Johnson or the phonological awareness test. And most of what you learn here today will be helpful regardless of the specific measures that, that will be used. But what you'll be doing is making the point that you're a knowledgeable participant. And that can make a difference in the outcomes for the child or the person you care about. So let's talk a little bit about um, what we know dyslexia is and what it isn't. This is pretty important because there are a lot of common myths out there about dyslexia. And if you just ask a neighbor uh, about what dyslexia is or, or a friend, chances are their understanding will be um, inaccurate. So it's important to know some of the myths as well as what's true about dyslexia. I'd like to begin by having you do a picture naming exercise. You're going to see two pictures. When you recognize the picture, I'd like you to name it, ideally out loud, but if you're looking at this uh, webinar in a coffee shop or something and you don't feel comfortable doing that, you could name it to yourself. Um, that'll be fine as well. So ready for the first picture, I want you to name it when you see it, and then I'll show you a second picture. I want you to name it when you see that one. So here's the first one. Here's the second one. So this is the first one you saw. Um, according to what most people believe, you have just so shown the hallmark sign of dyslexia because this isn't really the Statue of Liberty, but this is a mirror image of the Statue of Liberty. This is actually the Statue of Liberty. This isn't the Mona Lisa, but a mirror image of the Mona Lisa. Here's what the Mona Lisa really looks like. Um, what you've done now is made a reversal error. Reversal errors, examples would include seeing a B for a D or a, a was for a saw, or as my cousin Kurt, who got a ticket for going 53 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone, tried to explain that he had dyslexia, uh, it turns out these are commonly considered to be the, the defining feature of dyslexia. And this belief uh, has been validated over the years by a real observation, even though the belief is false. If you find struggling readers in the second grade, um, chances are they will be making reversal errors. Most average or above average readers in second grade won't be making reversal errors. So it was natural that when we saw children who were struggling with reading making these kinds of errors, and children who are good readers were not making these kinds of errors, we thought maybe this was really the problem. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, why we make reversal errors. There are several um, plausible reasons. The first has to do with how we are able to read. It turns out that reading is an unnatural act. Reading and writing are too recent to be selected for by human evolution. Human language is, it emerged roughly a million years ago, but the earliest cave paintings date from roughly 50,000 years ago, and the earliest known writing system developed only 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years sounds like a lot of time, but in terms of humans' ability to evolve, it's like snapping your fingers. It's no time at all. So we actually have not been able to evolve to learn to read. So how do we do it? What we do is we recruit or use abilities that have evolved over time. And for reading, the ones that really matter are language and, and vision. Um, but due to the nature of the reading task, the language part of it, it turns out to be harder than the visual part of it, unless you have a visual acuity problem or some other uh, problem with your vision. 
what we do is we store information, uh, images actually, of letters in words in the same part of the brain, the same little tiny part of the brain that's used to store visual images of things that mattered a lot for survival, like the image of a mountain lion, for example. It turns out that we don't do a good job distinguishing left and right mirror images of real lions, because it's still a lion that could track us down and try to kill us. So it really doesn't matter you know, to our survival. Um, in contrast, it turns out we are really good at distinguishing in the vertical dimension. A lion on its back is not quite the threat as a lion on its feet. Lions don't even really sleep on their back. So if you'd see a lion on its back, it's probably injured or maybe uh, you know, dead. So it's not the threat that a lion standing up would be. Um, turns out in this example, there are bigger pixel differences uh, in the lion that's standing up and the lion that's sort of the picture of the lion that's upside down than there are if I would show you the mirror image of that picture. But cognitive psychologists did a very careful job of creating things to look at that when you looked at a mirror image, or you looked at them upside down, there were the exact same number of pixel differences. When they did that, it turned out uh, humans were still much better at distinguishing things that were flipped vertically than mirror images. So it turns out that one reason for reversal errors then is simply the evolutionary history of the region of the brain that figures prominently in reading individual words. It didn't evolve for reading words. It evolved for processing images of things in the environment for which there's little pressure uh, in distinguishing mirror images. So that's one of the main reasons that we, it's easy for us to make reversal errors pretty much in our daily lives. There are some other reasons that are more specific to reading. Um, first, B and D look alike. If you're going to confuse a B with some other letter, probably going to be a D or a G or something that's kind of the same. And in fact, when teachers teach Bs and Ds to children in kindergarten, sometimes they'll talk about a stick and a ball uh, where the stick comes first and then the ball for the B and then the ball and, and then the, followed by the stick um, for the D. So if you're going to make a mistake, you're going to make a mistake with something that looks similar to what you're looking at. That's one reason. Second reason is that B and D actually sound alike relative to sounds of other letters. They're both called stop consonants, and they're called that because of the way we make the sounds. Um, we make the sounds of both the B and the D by, by stopping the flow of air over our vocal cords and then releasing it suddenly. Um, this is why they're called stop consonants. The difference in sounds results from what we do with our lips and tongue. Say a B and then D. And just try saying the B, D. And what you see is that we're really kind of doing a lot of the same thing, except our tongue and our teeth are doing something slightly different. And that's how we're able to produce the two sounds. But these are much more alike than a B and a J, for example. I'd like you to um, do one thing for me now. I'm going to show you some uh, Chinese text. What does the first character in this Chinese text look like to you? If you said it looks like a dash or maybe a straight line, um, you are wrong. It actually looks like something windblown with the letter B to its immediate right. Why? Because Chinese is actually read from right to left, not left to right, the way English is read. Whether you read from left to right or right to left or even um, up, up and down is an arbitrary aspect of a script. Um, knowing that uh, to read Read English, you have to do it from left to right, is something that must be learned. 
So confusing was for saw reflects an arbitrary aspect of English that it happens to be read from left to right. That's just something you need to learn. Finally, there's something called the difference between item and order information. Order information is more difficult to get right than is item information. Listen while I say a series of numbers and then I'd ask you to say them back. Seven, eight, four, two, nine, one, five, six, three. Try saying it back once. I actually gave you too many to say back correctly, but if I would write down what you'd say, what I'd find is that you made more errors in terms of the order of things, and you actually got more of the items correct, but just in the wrong order. So order information just turns out to be more difficult than item information, which is another reason for reversal errors. So if we take all this into account, what's the story about reversals? Yes, it's true. Children in second grade with reading problems make reversal errors. But it turns out, so do children routinely in kindergarten and first grade. Um, so if you actually compare children who are struggling with reading in second grade to younger reading age match normal readers, you really don't see a difference. The problem we made, and the mistake we made, was that in our early studies of children with dyslexia, we only compared them to same age average readers. This is called an age match design. We should have also compared them to younger normal readers matched in reading level to the older children with dyslexia. If we would have done that, we would have seen there really isn't a difference in, in the number of uh, errors they made, and also, if second grade teachers would just have you know, been consulted more or talked with first grade or kindergarten teachers, they would have seen that these reversal errors are really common. So to summarize uh, the story about reversal, which is important to do because this is the most common myth out there about dyslexia, it turns out to be an easy error for all of us to make. The, some reasons why reversal errors are easy to make in reading are known. We've talked about our evolutionary history. We've talked about the fact that they look alike. We've talked about the fact that they sound alike <clears throat> in, in terms of how they're produced. And also the problem of it's easier to remember item information than it is order information. A second grade student with dyslexia makes reversal errors because their reading level is typically the same as a first grade or sometimes even a kindergarten student when reversal errors are common. The student stands out because their age match peers make fewer reversal errors. So that's why we thought um, reversals were the key. Let's talk a little bit about um, what dyslexic reading looks like. What are things you're likely to observe if you have a child with dyslexia, as you uh, observe them trying to read. <coughs> One of the, the uh, first hallmark characteristic of the word level reading problem, which is what dyslexia is, it's a problem reading the words on the page, is an inability to sound out new words. When you come across a new word, you have to figure out what it is by sounding it out, most likely, or perhaps by analogy to some other word that you know. The second um, hallmark characteristic of children with dyslexia is that they have a small pool of words that are read automatically. Typical readers recognize a large pool of words with little conscious effort. So when they're reading along, <coughs> what they're able to do is pay attention to the meaning and focus on the comprehension. They don't have to consciously work to decode the words. What I'd like you to do is to do a little experiment with me. I want you to look at, but don't read the following word. Everybody ready? To look at this, but don't read it. You can't do it. 
um, the speech motor system that you would have used if you would have pronounced horseradish out loud would actually have been primed and you might have even sub vocalized the word horseradish to yourself. <coughs> you probably had a visual image of some horseradish and you might have even had a tingle in your nose. Uh, and it turns out that um, horseradish isn't even a very common word. Let's try it one more time. I want you to look at, but don't read the following word. <coughs> this is a real different experience. It's not a known word to you, and you most likely started to try to sound it out. Individuals with dyslexia come across many more of all chums than they do horseradishes when they read. And what that means is when they're reading, they've got to try to sound out too many of the words. And it makes it difficult um, for them to comprehend well. Some other things we see very commonly in children with dyslexia are poor spelling and writing. Uh, spelling and writing may even be more effective effective than reading is because spelling and writing are in some ways more difficult than reading. <coughs> I teach at Florida State University and I see a fair number of college students whose reading problems have been largely compensated for by, they, by the time they get to the university. So they've had good intervention, they practice reading a lot, and what you see is they have a much harder time with spelling and writing than they do with, with reading. And aside, too, I'll say is that um, if you have a child who's struggling with dyslexia and it's a pretty severe case of dyslexia, it can sometimes be a struggle uh, um, getting a child through school and even middle school and high school. Once you get to the university level, it typically is much easier. Um, we have great resources for students with this disabilities like dyslexia, and students typically find that it's a much easier thing to do when, once you're in college if you've survived middle school and high school. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Something else we see commonly with children who have dyslexia is poor comprehension. Um, reading comprehension may be poor, but it typically is a byproduct of not being able to read the words on the page. Unless there's a co-occurring language problem that extends beyond phonological processing, something we're going to be talking about in a little bit, um, their uh, problem with reading comprehension is because they're struggling to read the words on the page. They're not knowing what some of the words are. Um, they may be uh, misreading the word, or even if they're getting them correctly, it's taking so much effort and so much time that they lose the thread of the comprehension. They don't have enough words like horseradish. They're just noticing automatically automatically. There's another thing that can happen too. Um, over time, uh, if intervention isn't provided and for children with severe problems, if they don't get assistive technology and other kinds of accommodations, um, they're getting limited information through the reading channel. Particularly, they may end up reading, may end up, may end up not enjoying reading, and so they'll do less reading than their peers. Um, over time, that can affect what you know about the world, um, and it can affect your language. So you can actually get longer term language problems if you don't recognize a problem with dyslexia early, intervene, and also accommodate where necessary. It's a really important reason for early identification uh, because it's a way of getting, trying to avoid some of the negative concomitants that can come along with dyslexia later. Something else to say about dyslexia is it's what we call dimensional. There's a continuum that exists from having only a minor problem to having a very severe problem. You'll see different estimates of how common dyslexia is. They vary quite a bit, some from even maybe just three to 4% all the way up to 20% or one out of five. And I think those different estimates come because of uh, not recognizing that, that there are severe cases and less severe cases. So the higher numbers include children who don't have as, you know, incredibly severe problems. The lower estimates include only children with uh, very severe problems. 
Um, we commonly say that someone has or doesn't have dyslexia the same way we say that someone has or doesn't have high blood pressure or diabetes, but there really is a continuous dimension from very minor to very severe for high blood pressure, diabetes, and dyslexia. If you have a very minor case of dyslexia with some intervention, your reading may be pretty good, and the only symptom might be that spelling is just a little bit more of a struggle for you than we would expect. The more severe the reading problem, the longer it's likely to take, and the more it's going to impact um, reading as well as written language. In terms of where dyslexia comes from, uh, there was a major breakthrough, and that was the, the discovery that dyslexia is due to a problem in language, not in vision. The language system that's implicated is something we call the phonological system. We'll be talking about that um, a little bit in a little bit, but it's what we use for processing uh, speech sounds. Something else you'll notice and which also ends up being a myth about dyslexia. If you look at the eyes of someone with dyslexia when they read, uh, you'll see more stops and starts uh, and backward movements compared to average readers. But that's really a byproduct of not being able to read the words on the page, not a cause of it. So you should be skeptical about a visual, vis visual therapy treatments for dyslexia, for example. The kind of eye movements that you have to do when you read aren't um, under, under voluntary control. They're ballistic eye movements. And so the kinds of uh, training we can do um, affects a different kind of eye movements than you read for doing reading. <coughs> it's also the case that dyslexia runs in families. A family history of reading problems is associated with a four times greater risk of having a child with dyslexia. But note that having a, ch a parent with reading problems does not destine the child to have reading problems. Even with a four times greater risk, the chances that a child won't have dyslexia are greater than the chances they will, even if a parent has dyslexia. I'll say that, that one more time. If you have dyslexia or your husband has dyslexia or your wife has dyslexia or it runs in your family, and you have a child, don't assume they're automatically gonna have dyslexia. Um, they still have a slightly greater chance of not having it than having it. Dyslexia occurs in both males and females, but males are not to be about twice as likely to have the more severe cases of dyslexia than our females. So um, boys and girls can both have it, but if it's a severe problem, they're about a two to one ratio of boys to girls. It's also the case that um, dyslexia rarely occurs alone. And that actually causes a lot of practical problems when uh, you know, people evaluate a child, they'll often see these other things and assume that's really the cause of what's going on. But co-occurring conditions, when something else occurs along with dyslexia, turns out to be the rule rather than the exception, more common than not. Common co-occurring conditions include attention deficit disorder or ADHD, um, dysgraphia, where you actually have problems in writing, um, dyscalculia, where you have problems doing math calculations, poor spelling and writing as we've talked about, and it's also pretty common to have a history of early speech or language problems. So we've talked a lot about what dyslexia isn't and we're going to start now talking a little bit about what it is. Um, we said that it's a problem in language, not in vision, and the language system that's implicated is the phonological system. It's the system that's used for processing speech sounds. So let's talk a little bit about what is phonological processing. It's kind of complicated in terms of all, all this um, language in these terms, um, but I'm going to use them anyways. But the, the good thing is I'm going to actually show you examples of 
phonological processing task. So you'll get it, you'll understand what it is when you see those little examples. Uh, formally, phonological processing refers to using speech sounds for coding information when reading, listening, and speaking. The origin of the term phonological comes from the Greek word phone, which means sound or voice. And it turns out we recognize early on there are three kinds of phonological processing that are particularly important for reading. They are something called phonological awareness, phonological memory, and rapid naming. We'll talk about out, um, each of these in turn. And again, uh, you'll see examples of them and hopefully that'll make it a little easier to understand. The definition of phonological awareness is awareness of and access to the sound structure or phonology of one's language. Um, what the heck do we mean by that? Think about these words, listen to them. Cap, map, and tap. You just think about the, you, as you hear them, cap, map, and tap, how are they the same and different in the sounds they contain? It turns out they have the same sound in the middle, ah, same sound in the end. What they have are different sounds in the beginning, like k, m, or t. If you can hear how they're the same and how they're different, their spellings make sense. They have a different first letter and they have the same middle and final letters. If you can't hear how they're the same and different, then the spellings are arbitrary. So instead of sort of seeing what this system is, that in fact, sounds are represented by certain letters, it becomes a completely arbitrary system. And all you can try to do is memorize um, the spellings and the sounds and the words that go along with them. It's very difficult to do. It's a much harder task to try to learn to read. And that's one reason why if you have an impairment in phonological awareness, which is very common in dyslexia, it's just a more difficult task to try to learn to read. The second kind of phonological awareness is phonological memory. It refers to coding information phonologically for temporary storage in short-term memory. Listen to this um, phone number I'm going to give you and then uh, pretend like you're gonna dial it. So the phone number is 851-642-9384. If you try to dial that number, um, what you're typically doing is you're not actually imaging the digits, but you're um, remembering the sounds. So you're remembering the, the, the pronunciation of those numbers and how they um, sounded. You might have even rehearsed them a little bit and you rehearsed them by the same. So if you actually try, try to remember a number of someone's name, you're gonna be using phonological memory. This, the speech sounds is what you're trying to remember. Rapid naming, um, the task here is to show strings of either digits or letters or objects and colors. And the idea is you ask the child to name them as quickly and accurately as possible. Rapid naming of these things requires retrieving phonological information or the pronunciation of their names from your memory. Turns out we use the same retrieval process when we're retrieving pronunciations of words or parts of words that we come across as we read them. So <clears throat> what we've talked about is, you know, why it's important for you to understand some of this stuff. You need to be an active parent. It helps if you're a knowledgeable parent, uh, people will do a better job working with you to try to get the most uh, effective assessment and intervention um, for your um, child or um, person you care about. Um, we've talked about what dyslexia is and what it isn't. We've talked a little bit about phonological processing and 
and we're going to show you some actual tasks that measure phonological processing. And that'll help you also figure out um, what some of this stuff is. Um, the example we're going to be using as we do this part of it is called the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing. This is the second edition, so it's called the um, CTOP2. It's probably the most widely used test out there right now that measures uh, phonological processing. Um, the CTOP2 measures phonological awareness, phonological memory, and rapid naming for individuals aged uh, 4 to 24. And so if you remember, those are the specific three kinds of phonological processing that we were talking about as related to learning how to read and reading effectively. The CTOP2 is used to identify individuals who are markedly deficient in phonological processing ability. Um, that's primarily why it's used to assess children um, who are who thought thought they or thought to maybe potentially have dyslexia. It's also used to identify individual strengths and weaknesses, and it's also used to evaluate the progress uh, of children when they're uh, getting phonological when they're getting interventions to try to improve or remediate their phonological problem, uh, phonological processing deficits. In terms of how it's administered, um, it's appropriate for individuals from four to 24 years and 11 months in age who can understand the directions. The examiner should have extensive formal training in the assessment and the entire core battery takes about 30 minutes to administer. There are two forms of the test, one for children ages four to six, and that's what you're looking at now. This is the record form. It's the form that uh, the examiner uses to record your child's responses and also to uh, help score the measure. There's another one for um, children who are age seven up through 24. There are different kinds of scores that are used in the CTOP2, they're also used in other assessments that your child may be given. The first is raw scores. These are just simply how many of the items the person got right on one of the subtests. Tests are made up of subtests, uh, sort of individual tasks we ask children to do, um, and just how many of those they got right for each of those individual subtests or tasks. That's what the raw scores are. Age equivalent identifies the age at which performance would be average. Grade equivalents identify the grade at which performance would be average. These aren't recommended for use because of some common misinterpretations that we'll talk about in a minute, but they're, they're available on most tests, including the CTOP2. More useful are percentile ranks. Percentile ranks indicate the percentage of people in the standardization sample or normative sample that scored at or below the examinee score. So if your child scores, say, at the 30th percentile, that means they did better than a third of the people, uh, sort of basically peers of their age, they would do better than a third, but worse than two thirds. Subtest scaled scores, um, these are sc standard scores with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of three. Well, what does that mean? It means that the average score is 10, and you typically see most kids scoring within a range of, of say, 7 to 13. Finally, there are composite scores, standard scores with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And these are going to turn out to be the most useful scores that we'll um, be looking at on the CTOP2, and we'll be talking about them some more. One last score I need to mention is something called a developmental score. It's, used, it's useful for examining absolute changes in performance over time. What this means is that for the developmental score, the difference between a score of 50 and 100 is exactly the same as the difference between a score of 100 and 150. You might think well, this, this makes just perfect sense, but in fact, for most tests, um, the difference between 50 and 100 and 100 to 150 doesn't really, isn't exactly the same difference in actual performance. A developmental score gives you this. 
Uh, this makes this useful for monitoring long-term progress in response to intervention. In terms of some general recommendations, composite scores are preferred over subtest scores because they're more reliable. A com composite score is the combination of several subtests. Because of that, they tend to give you more accurate scores than scores from single subtest. They're the most useful scores on the CTOP2. For a subtest, if you're going to compare one to the other, you need to use standard scores that compare performance to the normative sample. Um, because if you just use raw scores, some subtests have more items than others, so you can't really just compare raw scores. Developmental scores are used to measure change in absolute performance over longer periods of time. On the CTOP2, composite scores are available for each of the three kinds of reading-related phonological processes. Phonological awareness, phonological memory, and phonological and rapid naming, and they're combinations of individual subtests. The way to interpret composite scores is this. Um, most people score in the average range, and that would be between 90 and 110. And if you look at that um, figure on the right, you see mo most people are scoring in the middle. Uh, fewer people, but still some, score below average, poor, or once in a while even very poor. And similarly, some score above average, fewer score superior, and even fewer still score um, very superior. <coughs> um, note that some tests differ in how they actually interpret performance. For the CTOP2, scoring 89 or below is considered to be below average performance. In terms of the subtest scaled scores, it's a standard score that's identical for each subtest, making it possible to compare performance across different subtests. The average um, subtest scaled score is 10. So if you're comparing two subtests, and you get a 10 and a 12, you know the performance is a little better on the 12 than on the 10. In terms of interpreting subtest scale scores, 8 to 12 is in the average range, 6 to 7 is in the below average range, 4 to 5 is in the poor range, um, 1 to 3 is in the very poor range, 13 to 14 is above average, 15 to 16 is uh, superior, and 17 to 20 is very superior. And here's just a graph too to show that most people score in the average range. Fewer people score either above average or below average. These are the CTOP2 subtests and composite scores for the four to six year old version. And um, what I'll, we're going to actually go through them. Uh, but for phonological awareness, the first kind, there are three um, four subtests, elision, blending words, and sound matching. I'll show you what those are. For phonological memory, they are set, uh, uh, memory for digits and non-word repetition. And then there are two kinds of naming where you're either naming digits and letters. We call that symbolic naming or colors and objects. We call it non-symbolic naming. And there's a blending non-word subtest as well as an alternate. In terms of the phonological awareness composite score, as we mentioned, for children aged four to six, the composite score consists of elision, blending words, and sound matching. There's a supplemental blending non-words available to confirm a problem that you might see in blending sounds. So here's the first task called elision. You're asked to say a word after dropping out a part of it. For example, an easy item would be say cowboy. Now say cowboy without saying cow. Correct answer would be boy. Slightly more difficult would be say grain. Now say grain without saying mm. The correct answer would be gray. <laughs> so this is this, to do this task, you've got to be able to um, be aware of the sounds in words and then manipulate them, drop them out basically. For blending words, Spoken words are presented in parts that must be blended together to form a word. For example, 
you will hear, hear a word one part at a time. Listen carefully and put the sounds together to make a whole word. M, mm, oo, s. Put those together, you get moose. Um, Non-word blending would be the same thing, except instead of making a real word, you'd make a word that wasn't a real word. Finally, sound matching. The task is to identify a word that begins with the same sound as the target word. Later, it changes to identify the word that ends with the same sound as the target word. For example, which word starts with the same sound as soap? Wipe, toast, or sand? Sand starts with the same sound as soap. They both start with the s sound, and that would be the correct answer. <coughs> For the 7 to 24-year-old version, phonological awareness is also measured by elision and blending words. But sound matching is replaced by phoneme isolation. The phonological memory tasks are the same. The rapid symbolic naming tasks are the same, and they don't. There's no no non-symbolic naming for the seven to twenty-four-old, twenty to seven to twenty-four-year-old version. And there's an alternative phonological awareness composite that consists of blending non-words and segmenting non-words. So as I mentioned, uh, elision and blending words are there, but sound matching is replaced by phoneme isolation. For the phoneme isolation task, the task is to say part of a word that's, that represents the first, second, third, or fourth sound in a word. For example, what's the second sound in the word which? Correct answer would be if. And that's what you have to say to get that um, item correct. The alternate um, phonological awareness composite score for uh, children and adults age 7 through 24 is blending non-words. So it's the same as the blending sounds task I showed you before, except it doesn't make a word, it makes a non-word. Um, segmenting non-words is another one. So I might say a non-word like plin, and you've got to say the sounds one at a time. P oh, yeah, mm. That would be um, segmenting non-words. Turning to phonological memory, uh, for all children and adults, the phonological memory composite score consists of memory for digits and non-word repetition. You've actually done a couple of memory for digits tasks uh, already. The task is to listen to a string of digits and then to repeat them back in the correct order. For example, three, eight, five, nine, four, seven, two. To do that, if you don't see them, you're going to be using your phonological memory. Non-word repetition, the task is to listen to non-words and say them exactly as they are heard. For example, listen to this made-up word and say it exactly as you hear it. Vudasov. You can say that, you're using the, your memory for the sounds uh, that make up that word. If that's not a real word, you can just refer to. In terms of rapid naming, there's a composite score. Um, and for children aged four to six, there are two of them rapid symbolic naming, rapid non-symbolic naming. For children and adults, um, the only one is rapid symbolic naming. Here the task is to name letters presented in rows as quickly and accurately as one can for one of the subtests, and the other subtest is to do the same thing for digits. So you see a series of digits in rows, and you, quick, you name them out loud as quickly as you possibly can. For non-symbolic naming, the task is to name colors, like the squares that are colored, and you have to name the colors as quickly and accurately as you can, or there'll be pictures of common objects. And again, you need to sort of name them as quickly as you can. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do is review a completed record form, and we've gone through a lot of information. But hopefully with this webinar, you can hang on to it, and then if your child or uh, someone you're caring about is evaluated, you can actually get, ask for a copy of the completed record form. You can then have it in front of you and go through this webinar and compare and see, um, try to better understand what you're looking at in the record form. And again, if you don't understand something, you should feel free to um, ask the examiner who gave the measure to help you interpret something. So here's an example of the front page of a record form. And we'll start with 
the, the uh, section of the top right. This is where identifying information is put. So the child's name will be there, parent guardian might be listed. Um, we see that the date tested is there, the date of birth is there. And by putting those both in there in terms of years, months, and days, you're able to calculate the age of the child in terms of years, months, and days. And you actually use that to look up their performance in um, tables. Um, you'll indicate whether the child is a male or a female, their grade, probably what school they're in, what their teacher's name is, um, who was the examiner, and what their title was. Then we get to the meat of this, which is the score reporting section. And we'll talk about these in a little bit of detail. First part is raw scores. So if you look on the very left, you'll see the um, names of subtests. And then the first score you see is raw scores. This is simply how many items were correct for each of the subtests. It's not very meaningful for comparing subtest performance because they have different numbers of items. So getting 12 raw score points on, uh, say, elision might be very different than getting 12 raw scale points on memory for digits, just in terms of number of uh, uh, items there are. Age and grade equivalents are there. Um, these are the age and grade that the score would be average for. Um, as I mentioned before, it's not recommended we use those because they're commonly misinterpreted. For example, a uh, grade equivalent of 1.0 does not, does not mean that Joshua is the same as a student who's beginning first grade in terms of phonological awareness. But his score is the average score at beginning first grade, and that's all it really means. If we next, next look at the um, scaled scores, those are the ones in the circles. These are the best scores to compare performance across different subtests. Um, however, it's better to use the composite scores to see whether performance in phonological memory, um, phonological awareness, and rapid naming are different or the same. So we see these um, composite scores below. Um, so for phonological awareness, the composite score was 82. The same score was the composite score for phonological memory. Rapid symbolic naming, the composite score was 79. And for the alternative phonological awareness that was given, the um, composite score was 88. Descriptive terms are associated with those scores. They're the same ones I showed you on an earlier slide. So for Joshua, his phonological awareness is below average. His phonological memory is below average. His rapid symbolic naming was poor, and the alternate phonological awareness uh, performance was below average. So you can see that he is scoring below um, average or worse on uh, all of the uh, composites. Percentile ranks show that Joshua's scores are only better or equal to than the bottom 8 to 21 percent of his peers. So if you look at the, the um, <clears throat> Percentile ranks, you see um, for phonological awareness, it's 12. That means that that score is lower than all but 12% of the scores in the whole normative sample. So that's a pretty low score. Um, the phonological memory score was also as bad. Uh, rapid symbolic naming was even worse. That score is better than only 8% of people in the normative sample. And phonological awareness, uh, the alternative was a little better uh, with a um, percentile rank of 21, which means it was better than about a fifth of the scores in the normative sample. Um, Joshua is below average or poor in every area of phonological processing. The person who gave the CTOP2 can actually look to tell whether the composite scores are different than one another, whether Joshua has a significantly worse problem in rapid symbolic naming than in, say, phonological awareness, for example. It's important to keep in mind that phonological awareness is just one area to assess, to determine whether anyone has dyslexia. It's important to do a comprehensive assessment that extends beyond phonological processing. Let's finally turn to some frequently asked questions about um, dyslexia and phonological processing. 
first one is, is a deficit in any of the three composites, phonological awareness, phonological memory, and rapid naming, a potential cause of dyslexia? The answer to this is yes, because each of these three kinds of phonological processing is related to and important for reading. If you're really bad at one of these, some aspect of reading will be difficult for you. Second question, can an individual have dyslexia and not score poorly on the CTOP2? It is possible, it doesn't commonly happen, but it's possible, especially if a lot of intervention on phonological processing uh, has been given. Um, here are some reasons why a dyslexic student might not show a problem in phonological processing on the CTOP2. Um, if you assess a single indicator, for example, especially a single subtest, uh, it, won't be prob it won't be present in all students due to measurement error. So sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. This is more likely to occur when only a single phonological measure is assessed as opposed to relying on those composite scores that I said were better. Um, also, students with dyslexia who have higher vocabulary scores more, may score better on measures of phonological awareness and mask a phonological awareness problem that they have. The reason for this is that um, it helps to know the word to do phonological processing, phonological awareness tasks on it. If you have a larger vocabulary, you'll know more of the words on the test, and that can, that can be a help. Also, um, if, you've gotten, if you've received some intervention, most likely the intervention has focused on phonological awareness. If there's a lot of intervention, you can actually get improved phonological processing, especially phonological awareness. Another question, what is the double deficit hypothesis? It refers scoring below average in two of these areas of phonological processing, phonological awareness and rapid naming. Whether it really is a separate condition or just an indication of very low phonological processing is a matter of con controversy right now. It may not be a special uh, kind of dyslexia, however. Next question. If an individual scores in the average range on the CTOP2, but well above average in IQ and language measures, would this be an indication of a phonological processing problem? Um, yes, it would because phonological processing is impaired relative to performance in other areas. Next question. I was told my child's poor performance on the CTOP2 was because of inattention and not poor phonological processing. Is this correct? <coughs> Excuse me. It probably isn't. Problems in attention and in phonological processing commonly co-occur both are predictors of dyslexia, but inattention in it of itself doesn't explain poor performance on the CTOP2 for most individuals. When should the supplemental subtests or alternative phonological processing composite score be administered? The supplemental subtests and alternative composite scores can be used to a further assessment to confirm either a suspected weakness or strength in phonological processing. <coughs> what if there's a large range between the subtest scores within a given composite score? Would that indicate the need for further assessment? <coughs> it would suggest the need for further assessment. Perhaps the student did not understand one of the tasks that made up the composite. These are the two references that were cited uh, during this webinar. <clears throat> I'd like to thank um, the sponsors uh, who uh, really made this webinar possible. <clears throat> thank you very much. And this ends the webinar.